Well, good morning to you, Good Shepherd. It is really good to be together. Yes, I'm still on one crutch after falling off a horse. Frankly, at this point, as someone said this morning, it's window dressing to keep my doctor happy because I'm feeling great, and it is so good to be with you. You know, you're probably familiar with the butterfly effect, that maybe just a butterfly and its wing could cause a massive ripple effect beyond what we can hardly comprehend. I often think about that with the name of someone, Tom Brands. Uh, Tom Brands, you're probably not familiar with him. Uh, you probably don't know him. Uh, you probably won't find a lot of information about him on Google. But I often wonder where I would be if it were not for the faithfulness of Tom Brands. Often where I, would, I often wonder where I would be if it were not for the faithfulness of Tom Brand saying yes to Jesus as a teenager and then accepting a call into ministry and then faithfully guiding me to experience the life-changing power of the gospel. I often wonder where I would be if it were not for his faithfulness and in inviting me out to coffee one morning before school with another volunteer and sharing the truth and the power of the gospel that rocked my world and changed my life, I often wonder, would I be here right now? That's why we're continuing this series, Be the One. Because of the faithfulness of Tom Brands, had the boldness to share the good news of the gospel to a 15-year-old teenage girl. We want to be the church that ensures 40 years from now, when we are no longer here, when a lot of us, this front row, you guys are still gonna be here, a lot of us won't be here. We wanna be the church that ensures that 40 years from now, that when we're no longer here, there are those that have been trained up to preach the gospel. Not only that, but there are those that have been trained up to preach the gospel, and then they are creating space for the next generation. We believe so passionately that we have been called to live into this great commission to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that includes making disciples of all generations, of every age. And we believe that we are at a critical juncture in time, a critical moment in our church, where we've experienced incredible growth and movement here. We're experiencing flourishing and we're seeing the fruits of the Spirit. And we believe that we're at this critical juncture where we've got to figure out how to continue to make space, make more space for the next generation. And so we want to be the one to ensure that 40 years from now, there are still those that are here faithfully preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and that life-changing gospel. So with that, let's pause for a moment and open up our hearts in prayer. God, we open up to you. We know that you are here. Give us faith to hear from you. Give us ears to hear. Give us a mind to understand. Give us soft and supple and moldable hearts so that we can leave this place inspired and edified by your living word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Many of you know that Jeff and I love going to national parks. Uh, almost every summer we visit a national park as a family in our, in our camper. And the very first time I saw the Grand Tetons, I just could not believe my eyes. How many of you have ever, raise your hand, you've been to the Grand Tetons? If you're joining us online, shout out in the comments if you've seen the Grand Tetons. First time you ever see the Grand Tetons in person, it just is shocking. That's the, that's the only way I know how to put it. It is shocking. It doesn't even look real. It looks like it is just uh, made up, I mean, just a cartoon almost. It's so perfect. It's so grandiose. These massive just mountains shooting up into the sky. And the very first time I, I saw it, I, I pulled out my phone right away. And I started taking pictures. And I started sending it to people. And I even, I even remember at one point FaceTiming my dad. Tell you, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. But the pictures and the FaceTiming never even did justice. I remember looking back at the pictures, I was like, oh no, that's not what it looks like. I mean, this is nothing what it's like. Nothing compared to looking out at the Grand Tetons for the very first time, standing next to my husband and my boys, and us experiencing it together with our own eyes. There's nothing like experiencing life together with people 
in person, embodied. We were made for connection. We were made to be in relationship. We were made to be in community. And here is the reality that emerging generations are facing today. This device just won't cut it. It's been said that this generation, that really that we live in the most connected generation of ever. We are the most connected. We see this through the globalization. We see this uh, through social media. I mean, we're always connected to other people. Uh, right now, we've got a, a row of, of teens crammed up here. Uh, and probably as we speak, their phones are vibrating as they're getting uh, Snapchats, as they're getting text messages of reels. And they're, they're connected always. And yet, psychologists and sociologists note that even though we are so connected, this is the most isolated generation. And this really kind of spans many different ages, a lot of ages. Um, I, would, I would say this includes my generation and even older as well. Even though we are connected, we are incredibly isolated. In fact, I read this fascinating article on psychology today that notes three different reasons why emerging generations are the most isolated generation ever. Uh, number one, overstimulation. Um, of course, we know that they are uh, overbooked, overscheduled in so many different ways, uh, so many different camps to go to. We, we, fill, we overfill their days with something. Kids have lost the art of being bored. Kids have lost the art of being bored, and I would say even adults, too. I mean, like, have you ever, like, walked into Chipotle, say, and there's, like, a line of 10 people, and you realize you left your phone in the car, and you're like, how am I going to wait in line behind all of these people without my phone? What am I going to do this whole time? Like, we can't handle it. So we run out to our car, and, and we get our phone, we, because we, we don't know how to be bored. We don't know how to not be stimulated. And so we're constantly stimulating ourselves, and that's keeping us away from life-on-life -life relationships. Uh, the second reason we know is social media. Uh, that creates this whole comparison culture. Uh, it creates just this temptation to put a veneer of our lives out there, of, of telling the world that this is, this is who I really am, but we all know that's not who we really are. I mean, it's not that those things are untrue. It's just not the whole picture or the whole truth. And the third reason, which this kind of rocked my world this week thinking about, I don't think I ever thought about this before until this week when I was reading this article. The third one is what they call a dependency shift. Now, I'm sure all of you are, are very educated and you've heard about this, but this, this in particular kind of blew my mind. If you think about it, 40 years ago, if your refrigerator broke, you went to your neighbor's house and you found you know, someone, one of your neighbors that was handy, you said, hey, I don't know what to do about my fridge, it's not, it's not working right now, I, I wonder if you could come over and, and take a look at it. And they come over and then you end up you know, hanging out, you pull out a couple beers from the fridge or maybe you, you eat dinner together and you're, you're depending on one another. Today, when the fridge breaks, we Google it, we watch a YouTube tutorial, and we figure out how to fix it ourselves. Or before, if, if something in your life, if you're experiencing a crisis, maybe, you walk over to the neighbor's house and you plop down on the couch and you start to talk it through and you start to work it out because you depended on one another. Now what we're noticing is that we're starting to depend on this device and technology for the information that we need, including life crises. We're looking to influencers uh, we're looking to chat GPT to solve all of our problems and our issues, and we are losing the very thing that we were made for, which is human dependency. In fact, we see in the very beginning, when God created Adam, it was said that it is not good for man to be alone. God created humans to depend on one another, to rely on one another. In fact, uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their later, labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The writer of Ecclesiastes was onto something here. And so is the Apostle Paul. We see this in other places as well. When the Apostle Paul gives us uh, this image of, of the weak being helped by the strong. We were created for this kind of human dependency and we're losing the very art and the gift 
of human dependency. I could bore you with all sorts of statistics about the rise of anxiety and suicide and depression that we have noted since this device has come out and was invented. We are surrounded by connections. We are connected all of the time, and yet this is the loneliest and most isolated generation of our lifetime. So let's begin with this most important principle. You and I were made for community and for human dependency. And this device right here, while it's really convenient and there's a lot of gifts about it and there's a lot of really good things about it and in many ways it makes our life easier, this won't cut it. And this cannot be a replacement for the kind of human connection that you and I were made for. I've always been drawn to the work of Kurt Thompson. Kurt Thompson is a Christian psychologist who writes a lot on community. And one of the things, this breakthrough study that he has, um, he's, he's worked on, is he talks about the, the healing power of being known. One of the things that he talks about is that um, someone maybe who's, who's gone through a difficult time that Maybe they they have some bumps and emotional bruises as a result of the difficult time that they're going through. Maybe they have some depression or anxiety or maybe now some trauma responses and they're they're just really hurting. Or maybe they're going through some sort of addiction or maybe they're really just wrestling through something in their life. He says one of the number one ways that we see people experience the type of healing and wholeness that they need to have that breakthrough is when they discover the healing power of being known. That is to enter into a community, into a safe circle of people, and to come and bring all of your baggage, to come and bring all of your vulnerability, to come and bring all of your bruises, to come and bring all of your addictions and brokenness and all the things that you don't like about yourself, and to be able to sit in community and say, this is who I am, and the community to be able to respond back to you and say, yeah, we see that and we love all of it. In fact, he says this. He says, to be known, and he talks about like just how scary it is to be known. He says, to be known is to be pursued. It's to be examined, to be shaken. In other words, it's just you can leave that up there. Let's pause right there for a second. It's not easy to be known. It's so much easier. I and mean, we see this with young people and even my generation as well. We like to be known through what we put out there on social media. We make sure we get the right angles. We take 30 pictures. I'm so guilty at this, you know, and I get a picture with my girlfriends, and I'll say to Jeff, I'll be like, okay, no, take the camera, tilt it up high, and then, you know, we'll look at it, be like, oh, no, no, we gotta redo it, we gotta redo it. And we just, you know, this goes back and forth like 30 different times, and Jeff's like, one is enough. Because we wanna curate. We wanna curate what we want people to know about us. We want to be known, because it's really scary when people see all the parts of your life. And he says, so to be known is to be pursued, to be examined, to be shaken. But he also says, to be known is to be loved and to have hopes and demands placed on you. You're now in a position of vulnerability. It is to risk not only the furniture in your home being arranged, but your floor plans being rewritten, your walls being demolished and reconstructed. To be known means you allow your shame and guilt to be exposed in order for it to be healed. Are you known? Are you known? Do you have safe spaces? Kurt Tapson talks about that One of the answers to loneliness and isolation and hurt and anxiety and brokenness and addictions is to find safe spaces to be in community and not through here. We were meant to experience safe spaces where we can be vulnerable, where people can know us, where people can know our fears, where people can know the longings of our hearts. And this week, I've been reflecting on Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, the story of the paralytic. 
It's this wild story that gives us insight into a really vulnerable moment for this man who is completely isolated by his condition. And so we're going to take a look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to open them up, we're going to look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Or you can follow along on the screens as well. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. But he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? What I want you to know is that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This story kind of hit me in a different way this week. (laughs) Because it's been really hard for me. I'm doing so much better now, but like the first couple weeks after breaking my leg, it was a really vulnerable experience for me. Having to ask for help on on things that I would normally do by myself, um, needing to depend and rely on others. Um, It was difficult, it was humbling. And at times it was really vulnerable and at times it was uh, mortifying. Now imagine this guy, like he's he's totally isolated by his condition, Uh, he's paralyzed. And I just wonder like if, like these four men, these four friends, these four buddies that are carrying him, Um, They get to this house and they see it's overcrowded. If it were me, and I bet if it were like a lot of us, we'd be like, oh man, don't even worry about it. This is ridiculous. Like, we can just go home now. Like, and then the four friends are like, no, no, man, we're going to tear open the roof and we're going to lower you into this party. Like, how mortifying to be such a wild inconvenience to this packed house that your friends go to such lengths that they actually tear open the roof. They vandalize the home. I mean, like, I get embarrassed, like, when people, like, have to, like, help me with a a lot of, you know, it's just, like, it's mortifying. Like, it's embarrassing. We don't like inconveniencing other people. And so this paralyzed man, like, he is, like, in this, this condition, in a very difficult condition. He's isolated, and he has to allow himself to be seen and to be known and to be vulnerable in order to be healed. Let me say that again. He has to allow himself to be seen and known in community by his four friends that have to carry him, tear open the roof, inconvenience, stop the party, and create a scene so he can be healed. He had to be seen in the condition of being paralyzed. And not only that, but Jesus also says to him, your sins are forgiven. In other words, Jesus was extending grace to him Jesus knew all of the hurting parts. Jesus knew all of the parts, the blemishes, the broken parts, the sinful parts. And he extends grace and love to him in that moment. I believe that God wants all of us to have a flourishing life. I know that things happen in life where we get bumps and bruises along the way. Because we live in a hurting world and hurt people hurt people. We pick up trauma along the way. We create, get anxiety along the way. Uh, We pick up addictions along the way. And I know that oftentimes we find ourselves in places where we just feel stuck. Perhaps the best place to turn rather than these devices 
solely thinking that we are connected is discover the healing power of being known in Christian community. See, we often talk about, do you know Jesus, which is an, a remarkable gift. Like, we actually serve a God that invites us to know him. Uh, John's Gospel, Jesus is, says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Like, God actually reveals himself through the person of Jesus, and today through the, the person of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We serve a God that is knowable. But this isn't just a one-way street where we just know him. This is actually about God also knowing us. I love the way Kurt Thompson puts it again. He says this, he says, to be known is to be one of God's passions. While he desires for us to have the experience of being known by him, just as important is his desire to experience being known by us. This is not simply for our benefit, as if he's not affected by us. He desires to be known by us as much as for what it does for him as what it does for us. To be known by God is not just about what it does for God, but it's for us. It's to come and bring all of it just as we are. The messes in our lives, the things that we would rather be hidden by a veneer God says, come to me just as you are. And the gift of the gospel is a God that meets us just as we are, where we are, and loves us as we are, and extends grace to us where we are. And one of the gifts that we get to experience is this can be experienced in community. To be known by God is to also be known in Christian community. We need people in our lives that know when we're hurting so that they can tear open the roofs and carry us to the feet of Jesus. We need people in our lives who look at us and say, it's okay that you're not okay. I'm here for it, and I'm with you in this. And I'm here in the ditches with you in this. Students, some of you are alone and isolated. Some of you are alone and isolated and really, really, really good at hiding. You are made for more. You are made for human dependency, and you are made for connections. I think maybe I've told this story before, but when my boys were real little, we used to love playing hide and seek, always right before bedtime, which uh, not a, always a great idea, it gets them real riled up. Um, but we would play hide and seek right before bedtime because we would turn off all the lights in the, in the house, and it would be really, really dark. And Noah, when he was really little, he was really good at hiding. Like, he could get himself, like, in cabinets behind dishes and, like, in the weirdest places. And sometimes, like, he was so good at hiding, it was like he just did not want to be found. And so we would give up. Okay, Noah, Ali, Ali, oxen free. Noah, come out, come out, wherever you are. Okay, Noah, we're getting really tired. It's time for bed. Okay, Noah, the boogeyman's going to come get you. If you don't come, like, you, you need to come out. Come out wherever you are. It's really good at hiding. Some of you are really good at hiding. And perhaps this is a knock on the door of your heart from the Holy Spirit. To come out, come out wherever you are. And don't let this be a substitute for what you were made for. Maybe it's time for us to go through another dependency shift. To learn the art of depending on humans and on one another to reclaim what we were made for, human connection and human dependency. And so there are all sorts of ways that, that we could reclaim that human dependency, but let's just take baby steps. Number one, are you in a group? Are you in a life group? We happen to offer those here because we really believe in them. They're not just about education, but they're about entering into community to be known, to step into spaces where you're not okay and that's okay and you're still loved. Students, get connected to a group. Come to Ignite. Come to Fuel. Adults, get connected to a group. 
Gentle plug, life groups kick off October 6th. And adults, what are you doing to create safe spaces for emerging generations? Do emerging generations know that they can come to you and not be okay? That they can bring them, their full selves to you and still be loved? Or do they feel like it's gonna be met with more finger wagging, more judgment, more condemnation? What are we doing big picture, and what are we doing as a church to create safe spaces for emerging generations so that 40 years, 50 years from now, when we're no longer here, there are still faithful gospel preachers. Let us pray. God, I'll be the first to confess right here in this space That as a pastor, I'm tempted to have it all together. That as a pastor, I'm tempted to curate my life on social media. That as a pastor, I am tempted to feel like I have to be the smartest one in the room. Or as a pastor, I'm tempted to feel like I have to have the most Bible knowledge or the least mess. But the reality is, I'm probably the biggest mess. God, I thank you for the spaces where I get to experience love with all the messes I bring. God, I pray that we would be a church that would not only come out of hiding, but would create safe spaces for those to come to be welcome, known, and loved. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.